welcome back. So we're going to talk about historical linguistics again in this lecture um, and focus a little bit more on how far back we can go and looking at lots of other languages and ways that we can compare languages um, to see what forms would have been like before we had documentation of these different languages. So this is what's known as historical linguistics. Historical linguistics studies language change over time. We've looked at some language change in the previous lecture, and we're going to look at some of the patterns of what has been found. So historical linguistics is actually one of the older fields of modern linguistics. So starting in the early 1800s, one of the early people that started getting some of these ideas was Jacob Grimm of the Grimm brothers, who realized that in ancient Greek, ancient Latin, ancient Sanskrit, there seemed to be some similarities in some of the words and some of the cognates. And so just like Latin became Spanish and French, Grimm had thought, well, there must be some earlier language that eventually became things like Greek and Latin and Sanskrit. And it turns out that he was actually pretty spot on. And so this was something that really led to starting to think about how we can look back before we have written documentation to think about what forms would have been like previously. So when we think about how far back we can go, a lot of times when we're thinking about what this actually means and how far back we can document and how far back we can look for what forms of language would have been like previously, it does in many ways depend on what documentation, if any, we have. As we know, many of the languages in the world don't have any sort of writing system, so that would limit some of that. But in English, for instance, we have writings going back over 1600 years um, that other unwritten languages don't provide us. So without a written record, we can still reconstruct earlier languages based on the modern, the present day spoken languages to about one or 2000 years ago, depending on how many of them are still spoken, what we can sort of see as what's similar to each other in currently spoken languages. With a written record, though, things like Latin, Greek, Sanskrit that have several thousand years of writing, we can approximate some languages such as Proto-Indo-European, um, which would be the form of languages that eventually branched off into the Indo-European family to about 5,000 years ago and maybe a little bit longer ago than that. So one way that this happens is through comparing related languages, comparing cognate words with each other, words that have similar meanings and similar sounds. So when we think about cognates, this is one of the really important tools that we use in linguistics to do historical linguistics. So a cognate or a cognate set is just two or more words that are historically related to each other in different languages. And these help us determine relationships between languages and can help us establish language families. So if we think back to the beginning of the semester when we looked at those different language families, this is one of the main processes that's used in order to determine how languages are related to each other and how we put them into language families with each other. And cognates will always importantly share two different things. So you may be familiar with cognates if you studied other languages. And cognates will always share phonetic material. So they'll sound the same or they'll sound similar in some ways. So it doesn't have to be the exact same sound. They can share some sort of feature. So if we think back to that IPA chart, that's going to be very helpful for us. But they also have to share semantic meaning. So they also have to have the same kind of meaning. And it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but often that is the easiest way to look back and to understand. So for instance, our English word cat and the Spanish word gat or gato are cognates with each other. So we have a velar plosive at the beginning, we have a low vowel in the middle, and then we have the t sound at the end. So those sounds are very similar to each other, even though they're not exactly the same. You can see a lot of the similarities between those sounds and historically, they are related to each other. But sometimes there are things that appear to be related that maybe have some sort of phonetic sharing, but aren't actually historically related. So one that example is the English word embarrassed and the Spanish word embarazada. Um, in Spanish, that word means pregnant. There is no semantic relationship. So even though they sound similar to each other, they don't actually mean the same thing and they aren't actually related. It's just more of a coincidence. Same with the English word exit and the Spanish ejito, um, which means success. They're not related to each other histor historically. So even though they appear related because they sound similar, they're not actually cognates because they don't fit both of those criteria. So those false cognates can be a little bit tricky. And so you need that semantic meaning as well in order for something to truly be a cognate. There are times that you can look at different words and you can say, well, do I have cognates? Are there other reasons that might explain some of these similarities? So one example that we can look at 
is the word for mother in languages throughout the world. So I'm gonna give you a set of several different languages. I'll let you look at them for just a few moments or you can pause the uh, video in order to spend a little more time looking at them. But these are different languages and their word for mother. So um, what you should do is just look at them briefly and then determine if you think that there is a language family here or if not, why you might explain what's happening. So these are different languages. These are all of the different ways that they would say mother. You can pause and spend a little bit more time if you'd like with this, or you can just kind of follow along. So as we're looking through these, you'll notice that they do look very similar to each other. There's a lot of M's, there's a lot of A's, there's nasals in the places where there's not an M. So there's a lot of similarities between each of these different words in their phonetic material. But is there a language family here would be the next question. So if we look at the languages themselves, Arabic, Greek, Catalan, Mandarin, Korean, Basque, Dutch, Vietnamese, we see a lot of different languages from around the world and some that we know are isolates as well. So when we're looking at this, we can't propose a language family just based on one word anyway. We would need more evidence. We need multiple words. But these languages also don't fit into a language family anyway because they're spoken in different regions. They're not spoken by people with similar cultures. Some of them are languages like Basque that we know are isolates, that we haven't found any relationship between that language and any other languages in the world. So the explanation here isn't that they're cognates and isn't that they're related. There's another explanation here. And this explanation is that for most infants around the world, their first vowel is an ah sound. And commonly first consonants are either bilabial sounds or alveolar sounds, so p, m, b. So it's very common for infants' first sounds when they just start moving their mouths and making noise before they know what they're doing to start muttering and to start babbling ma, 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 over and over again. Naturally, parents will often assume that the children are starting to say words and talking about them. So variations on mama or papa are actually nearly universal around the world because these tend to be the first sounds that infants make just when they're moving their mouths. They're opening and closing their mouths and they're just sort of testing things out. And those tend to be the first kinds of sounds that are made. So it's not that there's any sort of relationship between these languages. It's more of just a biological feature of how we start practicing sounds when we're born. So these are relatively universal across most languages, but it's not something that we can look at as a historical fact. So the way that we would take these cognates and actually apply them into looking at things historically is to use what's known as the comparative method. And so what you can do is to check between languages if they're related using this method by using cognates to check. So you would first find potential cognate sets in the language that you wanna compare and then you'd start comparing those words that have the same meaning for what phonetic similarities you might have between them. And most commonly this happens by using words that are very common and that would be seen as native in languages regardless of where they might be spoken, things that are seen as sort of central to humanity in general. So a, a linguist Swadesh came up with a list and there's a list of 100 words, there's a list of 200 words. This is the list of 100. You don't need to memorize this or write it down or anything. This just gives you an idea of the kind of words that we'll often start with when we're trying to compare languages. So things like personal pronouns, things like small numbers one and two, things like man, woman, person, things that you might find around the world um, are just around in the world around you. So fish, bird, bark, skin, body parts, concepts like sleep and eat that are things that we all do. Um, so these are very common words that would be th think that would be words that we would think would be found in most languages, regardless of where they're spoken, because they're things that we would expect humanity to have. And further, because they're so common, because they're so central to humanity, they're unlikely to have been borrowed from other languages. So they're more likely to be native words in that language that weren't borrowed from somewhere else because the language would have started with these words from the beginning and would not have really changed them over time because we use them so frequently. So we often use sets of these words in order to compare languages. And when we do that, it looks a little something like this. So if I give you a set of languages and I don't tell you which language is which, we have five languages here and then we have the English gloss on the right column. So if you take a moment and look through and try to decide which languages are probably related to each other, you're going to look at all of the different translations for the word in English and then try to see which ones have similarities in their phonetics. They don't have to be exactly the same, but they should look somewhat similar. 
So here, if you want to pause and take a moment and look at it, and then we'll talk about it, there are two different groupings here, two different language families that are represented. So you can decide which of these five, there, all of them will fall into one of two categories, and which patterns you might have for them. So if you've taken some time to do that, and you want to go through and look, the first group of languages are Austronesian languages. And so this is A, B, and D. And so these ones were Indonesian, Malagasy, and Tagalog. And if you look, Tagalog and Indonesian seem to have more similarities in common. They are more geographically close to each other. Indonesia and the Philippines are relatively close to each other. But then Malagasy seems to share some aspects, but not as many as those other two. And this is probably because Ma Madagascar, where Malagasy is spoken, is much further away. They've had more time to have their language change over time than the other two languages that are closer in proximity and maybe haven't had as much time apart to change as drastically. The other one is Germanic languages. So you had Swedish and Icelandic and then the English gloss, which is also a Germanic language. And you can see these ones have a lot of similarities with each other in most of these words. So svart, svartur, um, rod, rather red. Um, and you can even see similarities with the English words as well, since English is also a Germanic language. So when we're going through and determining how we know that these ones are the ones that are related, we can look at the similarities, we can look at the patterns, and we can try to look at some of the things that overlap between them. So we see some bolded areas here. So the itam in Indonesian and Tagalog for black, the puti in Indonesian and Tagalog, the me at the beginning of Indonesian and Malagasy, and the ah sounds at the end of that word. The sa in one is across all three of them. The ua or oa is across all three of them for the number two the tan and the an parts in Indonesian and Malagasy for hand are things that overlap and that are similar. They're not always exactly the same, but there are a lot of similarities that you can see. Same with the ones if we're looking at the Germanic, you see many overlaps between most of these where there are similarities in par parts of the word or some of the word or all of the word, um, and even with a lot of the English ones as well. So some of the differences, Swedish has a different source for hand than what Icelandic and English does. English has a different source for black, so our English source for black is actually the same uh, historical word as the French blanc for white. And this comes from the Indo-European word that meant fire or to shine. So it evolved into things that are bright and white and gold in some languages. So things like blank paper, bleach cloth, blanc, we get in languages like French, or because of that fire aspect, things that are dark and charred in words like black in English. So words that mean something very different actually have the same historical relationship between English and some other languages like that. And we can take these different comparisons and we can try to reconstruct what the previous language was. So the first step here is to just figure out if these languages are probably related. So we look for those similarities. We can say, these languages look like they're related to each other. There's a lot they have in common. There's a lot of sounds that are very similar. So then we can start comparing them and trying to reconstruct what the language would have looked like before. So we establish a cognate set and then we start sort of working backwards through looking at what these probable changes would be. So we'll be looking at some of those phonological processes that we looked at in the unit on phonology. A lot of those things will come into play here, but rather than looking at them in one moment in time, we're looking at how those changes happen over time. And it's a lot of the same kinds of processes. And so if we compare a lot of these sister languages that are spoken that we found a lot of cognates for, we can look for these kinds of processes, we can look for these kinds of patterns, and we can try to reconstruct what we call proto-words, or the previous form of the word of the mother language that would have come before. For the purpose of what we'll look at through most of this class, vowels tend to be less stable and change more frequently, so most of our examples will focus on consonants in class, although you can reconstruct different vowels as well in different languages. And so when we're looking for these historical versions, the proto-languages, the proto-forms, there's several steps that we want to take. And so we'll go through those together and we'll talk about how we come up with those different rules, how we go through those different processes to come up with them. So when we're looking for reconstructing forms, there's several steps we're going to take. So regardless of if a language is documented or not, we can start by just finding out what sounds are found in the same place in, word, in the word between different languages. So you start by looking at different words that are cognates, and you start with the things that are exactly the same across all of those words that you're looking at. 
So you would start positing these sounds using what we would say is a majority rules kind of idea to start. And then there might be some common sense kinds of exceptions, different phonological processes that make more sense for other languages to have done that are not just majority rules. But in most cases, you're going to be able to say, okay, well, if I have four languages and three of them are still sounding the exact same, that sound was probably in the proto form. It was probably in the language before because it's more likely that one language would change and the other three would stay the same than the reverse. So you do this in a couple of steps. So first, the clear cases, the ones that all have the exact same sound. And then you go on to the ones that maybe aren't quite as clear. And then you'll start reconstructing what that form looked like. And you'll come up with your posited proto form based on which sounds are most likely to have been in that earlier form. Once you've done that, then you can start coming up with rules like we had for phonology, where you're going to see, well, what are the sound changes? What are the rules that led from one previous form to a present day form? So if we look at an example of this, we'll look at a correspondence set. So this is a set of cognates that are words that mean the same thing that we've decided are related to each other. So we look at French, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese, and the word dear would be cher, caro, caro, and caru. And so first you're looking for whatever is exactly identical in all languages. In this case, there's not a single sound that's exactly the same across all four languages. So what we go for next is that majority rules. So we start with the very first sound of the word. So in this case, we have a sh, a k, a k, and a k. So sh, one sh, three k. In the second sound, we have an e and three a sounds. In the third, we have a r, and then we have three r sounds. And then the final sound, we don't have one in French, so that no or no sound would be the symbol we use again for that. And then we have an o, an o, and an u. So what we're going to do is take those first, we just come up with a list of what are the sounds that exist in each of these languages. And then we'll start looking for patterns. Once we have that set, we'll look for patterns, starting with majority rules. So if most or all of the languages feature the same sound, we'll posit that that was there before. And then if there's not a majority, then we'll start looking for other processes. So if we look at the first sound, sh, k, 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 we notice that k is in three of them. So by majority rules, we would say the proto form probably had a k in it. In the next sound, we have an e, an a, an a, and an a. So three of them have a, so we're going to say, okay, majority rules again, so we're going to have a. In the third one, we have a r, and then we have er, er, er. And so we'll say that that r sound is going to be the majority again. Three of them share that sound. Now for this last one, it's not exactly the same. We have a null, so no sound. We have an o, an o, and an u. But two out of four is still a majority when the others are completely different. So if it was two and two, you might have to do a little bit of thinking and do a little bit more work to process through that. In this case, O is still the majority. It's still the most common and the others aren't the same. So they're not really competing for that most common. So once we have those sounds together, we put them together into a word and that creates our proto form. So we would say caro would be our positive proto form for the word meaning dear. So that would be the form that we have. Those asterisks that you see represent that this is a form that we're recreating. It's a proto form. It's previous to documentation. So we're using our best practices to come up with that term and positing this as the proto form. So that asterisk just means it's a previous form. Once we have that, then we're going to go back to our, our present day forms and write rules similar to what we did in phonology in order to think about what are the changes that took place. So once you have that proto form, you compare it to your present day form. So your rule starts off with proto form looks like this. And then rather than an arrow, we use a greater than sign to sort of point towards the present day form. And then we still have that big slash and then the environment where it happens. So the rules look very similar to what we have in phonology, but there's those few slightly different symbols. So for instance, old Latin to old English has a rule that a long ah sound became an o oh sound. So mater in Latin became motor in Old English, and then other changes took place over time as well. So when we go back to our example for deer, we start with our proto form, caro, and then we need to find the patterns and rules for each language based on their present day form. French looks very, very different. So we have a lot of rules that we need in French. So the proto form is a k sound, and it's becoming a sh. The proto form is an a sound, it's becoming an e. Eh. 
the proto form is a r sound it's becoming a r and then the proto form has an o sound that's becoming nothing it's deleting italian and spanish look exactly the same as our proto form so we don't have rules to write for those ones and then in portuguese there's just one small change where the o is becoming an u sound so for each language you have your own set of rules and so in this case we only have one word, so we don't need to put any sort of environment. It's happening in every case that we see. But if there was an environment or a condition needed, then we would put it after that slash the same as we would with phonology rules. So in French, if we were to say, oh, well, the O is the leading at the end of words, which is where it happens in this case, we could put that slash for an environment and then put the underscore and the hashtag to say O becomes nothing at the end of a word. So if there is an environment where it happens, if you have to get more specific, you end up writing a fuller rule. But if it's happening across the board, regardless of environment, then you would just put the change and you don't need to put any sort of environment. Now, there are going to be some cases where you might have to reconstruct things without having a majority. And so it's gonna look a little bit different. So if we have a language like Spanish and or region, and these are the numbers two and three, we might say, okay, well, does the D become a T or does the T become a D? So without a majority, we have to look at what is the most likely process given what we know, but also you're going to come up with something that applies to the entire data set. So if you look in one direction and it doesn't work for everything and only works for some of them, then you might say, okay, that one's not going to work. So I need to check the other direction and explore that as well to see. So in this case, we have a D and a T. And if we say D goes to T, then we would have Spanish dos and Norwegian to. And so D becomes T, that works. And then we have tres and tre. And if we look at that, there's already just a T there. There's no change that needs to happen. That one would work. If we're looking in the other direction and saying Norwegian is more similar to a previous form and try to say T goes to D, then we would say, okay, in that first word, that works. T is becoming D. But in the second one, you would then expect a D in the Spanish, and we don't see that. So that one would not work. So in this case, D would have to go to T because it's the only one that makes sense for the entire data set. So hopefully that gives you all of the steps. We'll be practicing in our class together, going through lots of other examples of this. But in the meantime, if you do have questions, email me, schedule office hours, bring them to class. We'll have a lot of practice time on this that we'll be able to work on together.